I'm Janice Schwartz, I'm the principal. Hopefully you have seen me before. If you're here, I'm guessing that you have come to other events. Um, this is Sarah Corrington. She is our associate principal for curriculum and instruction. And current tech guru, give me one minute here. <laughs> so I just want to thank you for coming. Uh, we were just talking about kind of our first really kind of cold week night. Um, and, and as a, I think I haven't been out, so <laughs> everyone's coming in with, with coats, and I'm like, okay, it's pretty chilly out there, it looks like. So, all right, um, so did that already. I um, just wanted to introduce some of the people that are going to be um, speaking tonight. So, Lisa Marsicano is a parent of a sophomore and, um, and other children, but a sophomore here. And she's also an executive um, function skills specialist and coach. I always have to look at that. So it is, um, she does a lot with just time management and study skills, and that is what she is going to talk with, talk with you about. Um, and then we also have a few students. Um, Nicola Perna is over there doing some homework, and she is um, in 12th grade, and then we're going to see uh, Megan coming a little bit later. So these are students who can just give their perspective of what it was like when they were freshmen and what they found was helpful um, to be successful. So we thought it would be helpful if you met the people that were at your table. So if you could just take a minute and um, introduce yourself to the people at your table, because there's a couple times where we're going to ask you, hey, just you know, talk to them. Maybe you say, is this, you know, is this your first one in high school? How many actually is it your first person, first one in high school, first child? Okay, so most of the people. That's how we, what we designed it for. But for me, I have two children, and they're very different. And one I could have really used this for, and the other one I never had to open up the grade book because she was on top of everything. So, uh, so go ahead and take a minute to introduce yourself. Okay, uh, we'll come back together. I'm just going to give you an overview of what we're hoping you will walk away with tonight. This is something that all of our teachers do. They share with their students what they're expected to learn. So, and that's a really good phrase to use with your students, your children. What were you supposed to learn today? So they will get objectives, um, learning standards from their teachers. So we try to model that whenever we're doing presentations too. So um, we're gonna focus on what a student should be doing in order to be academically successful, because at the end of the day, that's the person who has the most responsibility, um, and how you can help your teenager be successful and then what are some of the North High resources that we provide that also um, your teenager can access so that we can work together to support our students. Um, we know that some students know how to do school really well and some maybe school is not their favorite or they don't mind it but they don't really know how to navigate it. And so that's where really this partnership helps us quite a bit. So just a couple things. Um, I want to make sure that we're working from some shared understandings. Success means different things to different families and to different individuals within families. And so I think it is really important, and I know Lisa kind of touches on that on this too, to understand and uh, have a common understanding of what success is. For my family, um, success for my son was a C. Um, and success for me, for, for him, was a C if it was a challenging subject that I knew he was working really hard and C was the best he could do. But it was not success if it was a C because he just didn't care and he wasn't doing his homework. And so, but I had my daughter who, if she got a B, that was failure. And we had to work through that and like, okay, you know what, a B is okay. Um, and you know, so success is mean something different to everybody, and I think it's important just to sit down and have a conversation with your child about you know what are the expectations and how do we know if you've been successful. Um, here at North, you will hear us time and time again. We talk about the importance of struggling. Um, students need to learn how to become resilient. They need to know what to do when they don't know something. A lot of our um, society, if you look at, look at research, we see that students. Um, teenagers, even college age um, students suffer from anxiety and depression at much greater rates than they ever have before. And that's because they don't think that they, they don't know how to struggle, they don't know what to do with it. Because on social media and everything else it looks like everybody's perfect and so they think that's what it's supposed to be. So we really try to challenge our students appropriately um, and let them struggle a little bit, not too much, we don't want them to give up. But we want them to know, like, we're not um, helping you if everything is just so easy that you're just getting it. Then why are you even coming? So it, it is important to let them struggle a little bit. 
Um, and we really focus on the learning. So yes, it's about the grade, and we 100% understand that for many people, the grade is really important because they're thinking about what they're going to do after high school. They want to get into this college, or they want this scholarship. So we know grades are important, and so I don't want to minimize those. But we really want to focus on the learning, because if the learning's not there, they're not going to do well in whatever their next step is. So it's not about, we'll just do this so that you can get the grade. Do this so that you can learn the material so then you can be successful. And we do try to teach our students responsibility and national, natural consequences. And so this is where it's really hard as a parent. Um, and you know, my, my children are 26 and 23, but I, I was where you were. And it is really tempting sometimes to bail them out and it, but it's that's not really going to be helpful in the long run. And I remember nights my, with my daughter who thought a B was not, um, you know, a good grade. She would come, she did golf one year, and golf is a great sport, but it's also very long for them to be out. And so she would come, and then she would be crying because she'd have a test. And can't you just call me in tomorrow because I'm not ready for the test? I'm like, no, you have to learn how to balance your time. Me calling you in and excusing you out of the test is not helping you become. An adult and so it was really hard to say no um, you know when you see your daughter crying and you don't love me and you're the worst mom ever and all of that so I'm sure you've seen this and heard this before and some of you can probably uh, remember this and but uh, she went to school and you know what she did just fine on that test but helping them understand the natural consequences so those are things that you will hear me um, say a lot and really everything that we do in our school you will find that we try to walk that very fine line where we are challenging our students and supporting them at the same time so that when they leave us, they are prepared for whatever they're going to do next. That's our goal. We want them to be academically in a better place, but also emotionally and mentally healthy as well. So I will turn it over to Ms. Corrington, and then uh, Ms. Marcano will be after that, and that will be our program. Thanks again for joining us this evening. I'd like to direct your attention to the back of the room. We call that our Joanna Gaines um, wood accent that we have here at, at North in the library this year. Um, we look at those things and it, we remind ourselves that uh, pretty soon it will be very, very pretty um, here at North High. Um, as Ms. Shore said, my name is Sarah and I have been in education for 15 years now. I started in education as a classroom special services special ed teacher and then became a dean, was a director of special ed for some years and then came here to North High to be the associate principal for curriculum and instruction. I also happen to be the parent of a daughter with ADHD. She receives some services and accommodations in school for that. And most of the time when I get to this point in the presentation, people think I'm sharing that to in some way position myself as an expert. And nothing could be further from the truth. What I've learned as um, the parents of a hurricane of a daughter who is uh, beautiful and brave and tough and sometimes disorganized is that we are constantly learning. Before I had kids, I probably would have told you that I was a bit more of an expert in this field and what I know now is just like any good classroom, we teach, we learn from what we teach and then we do it again and again. Sometimes the plan works, and sometimes the plan doesn't work and then we have to go back and reassess and that is all part of um, just the journey here in high school. So one thing I do believe without a doubt is that the very best partnerships happen when here as a school we make it clear the different things that we can do. We give your students choices and resources and options and that you also then understand uh, at, at home what it is that could be helpful as well. It's not always a perfect journey um, as students transition into high school, but with those two things in place, I can tell you without a doubt, they will grow, they will learn, they will get there. So my uh, first piece of advice here, if your student begins to struggle, and I want to stop and, and reference back to something Mr. Short said because I, I think it's important. When I mean struggle, I don't necessarily mean that the grades are really, really poor. It means that you know your student isn't performing to their potential. So that looks different for every single child. 
So struggle in your home is going to be different than struggle in my home. But nevertheless, you know your kids the best, so you know when this is happening. And what I'd like for you to do first is start with your teenager. Just the fact that you open the conversation and want to talk to them more will be something that goes a long way with them. And it's really important that they also understand and begin to learn how to articulate what it is that's a challenge, what it is that they're finding su success with, and what they might need to do to plan differently in the future. So I always recommend asking questions about specific assignments. Usually if you go into Home Access Center, you can get an idea by either a zero or a, a Z4 or Z5 that a student isn't um, getting credit for the work that they've given. Sorry about that. And you can also see patterns and missing assignments and other things that might start to surface to you about what it is that could potentially be going wrong. Um, at this point, this is often when you will get that overwhelmed uh, response from your child. I just don't know what to do. Another good place to start is asking about the teacher's policy and late work, if they can retake and redo assignments. I will tell you, very many of our teachers will do that and will allow for it. But if the student doesn't ask and it's not something that has risen to, um, risen to the surface, then that might not be something that the teacher's even aware is really important for your child. So, once you have had a chance to build that understanding, I am going to give you what I truly believe is the magic script for a student then to go in and talk to their teacher. And I say the student first because we are really building both independence and life skills here. We don't expect freshmen to have all this already. That's not at all what we would expect out of a student who's coming into us at 15 years old. But we're keeping in mind that in four short years, they will be beyond high school and their post-secondary lives. And that will mean that they need to build those skills in order to be independent. So we ask that students start with their teacher first. If a student approaches a teacher and says, I have tried to do, fill in the blank, in order to improve my grade, but I just feel like it's not working, what do you suggest I do next? I promise you, they will get direction and advice. It's really important that they start to know and think about what they've tried, what they've done. And this is a learned behavior for most of our kids. Most of our students, when they start with us, just say, I need help. You might have heard that at home when it's homework time. Just saying, I need help, sometimes makes it really hard to decide what to do next. This absolutely will be a way that your child can open a conversation with a teacher. Not sure why that looks like that, but I will explain to you what it says. Never, again, tech is really not, not really working for us tonight, but bear with us. I hope when we, when we actually send it out to you, it looks better. All right, well, we're going to start at sort of the um, basic level things that any student can do to receive help here at North High. And then throughout the course of this presentation, we're going to kind of go up the ladder into things that might be more intensive for an individual student. But let's start with resource. Any single student at any point in time during their day can get help with their assignments in our resource centers. Our resource centers are not staffed by paraprofessionals. They're not staffed by um, anybody who doesn't have a content area specific certification. These are all classroom teachers. It takes place um, both in the Math Resource Center, which is up in room 361, as well as our Science, English, and Social Studies, our combined resource. It happens right here, right in the library corner. I can tell you without a doubt, resource is one of the most underutilized things that we have here at North, supports that we have in place. There are some times that I will come up and we will have four and five teachers ready to help students, and maybe there's only three kids in there. And I tell you this, one, because I want your students to go, but two, because here's the secret. 
they could potentially be getting help in two different subject areas from teachers who are giving them almost one-to-one -one attention. It is a great option, and I highly recommend if you see those grades start to slip, that you tell your student that they need to go to resource either during their study hall, during their absent lunch resource, any open period that they might have in their day. I think that uh, last blurb there, it also says, just so you're aware logistically, they do not need to go and even check in at study hall. We take attendance up here so we don't lose any time. They can come straight to resource and then we clear their attendance from the other class that they needed to be in. We also have a number of students who tutor in order to receive credit for their National Honor Society service hours. The coordinator is uh, Mrs. Gunda uh, Barrett, and her email address is up here for you. That's another option. She can coordinate your student to have individual one-on-one -on -one tutoring with a peer tutor. They are ready to do this. They enjoy doing it because for students who are in National Honor Society, those service hours can be hard to get, and this is a great way to do it. If your child has a very full schedule and really can't get to resource during the day, we also offer Strive, which is after school tutoring. Again, it is staffed by our certified staff, by our teachers here in the building. And that occurs on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, right after school, right here again, this is the place, from 3.30 to, until 4.30. Uh, Strive is coordinated by Mr. Najjar, and what he does is tracks what students are coming in, making use of the program, and he also communicates back often with a counselor. So if you're working in tandem with the counselor, he can really help facilitate that conversation. If your child does have after school activities, I would encourage you to speak to the coach. Nearly always, the coach or the activity sponsor will say your academics are the most important. And if you need to go after school for help first, you can do that. And then you can arrive at practice a little late. I would say without doubt that this is one of the misconceptions that exists here as students come into high school. That if they're doing something, if they're playing a sport, they have to be there. And of course we want them to be there, but they're really here day in and day out to learn and to grow for their academic studies. So that is always a priority. There's also options in the world of technology to help you out here. I think for many years now, many of us have gotten very comfortable with Google Classroom. Most teachers now at North High maintain a Google Classroom or a Google site, which will give you information about their projects. Sometimes it's copies of projects. It's a class calendar. Any information you might need if a teacher maintains one will be there. So it's a great place to start when you notice there's missing assignments to then go to the classroom to say, okay, but here is the assignment. We see what we need to do, and then what do we need to do next? So it really kind of bridges the gap between what you're seeing in Home Access Center and what actually has to be done. Because often if it's just a title and a zero, it's hard to know. The math department also has a math department website, which I will link in the presentation for you. The math department has put together practice videos um, as well as the unit outlines and plans for all of the math courses in the department. So that is another good place to start for students who need support in math, just to understand what it is that we're expecting in each of those course levels. And then you might have heard of Khan Academy. Khan Academy also is a great resource for our students. It's often talked about in conjunction with the SAT, because Khan Academy has partnered with College Board in order to provide test prep. That, however, it, I mean, it's great. It's a great resource. You'll hear me talk um, when it comes to the uh, SAT season all about Khan Academy and how many students should have an account. But regardless, if you choose to use it that way for test prep, it still has many videos that are super helpful for the student who is stuck and then you don't have the teacher right there in, in your kitchen. It's a place to go in order to, to get unstuck when you're on, you know, on your own and at home. Okay, so if you've done all of these things 
and it's still not going well, then we always say, please, open the line of communication with the teacher. As I said before, not every student has the ability yet to self-advocate, and they sometimes need us. They need us to bridge that gap. Email versus phone call, what's better? Yeah. Email, yeah. Most teachers will always say email. They won't mind a phone call. It just takes much longer um, to return that. Teachers are in class in front of students for the majority of their day, so sometimes coordinating phone calls can, can be a challenge. So our teachers are expected to return your email within 24 hours. So if you reach out, you can expect that you will get some response in that time. As you go into the phone call, just make sure that you know what the most up-to-date grades are because that will just make the conversation far more efficient. If you're looking at the same grade report, then you can be talking about the same things instead of taking the time to figure out what it is that's missing first. You know, it's so important. We teach our students to be kind. And we also need to model that ourselves. I have been on the other side of the table as a parent and had to work with some school personnel at times that it was really challenging for me to keep an open mind. But I also know that when I went in with an open mind, I learned things about my daughter that I didn't know before. So if you go into a conversation assuming positive intent, we tell all of the teachers here to assume the same of you. Parents and teachers, when they work together, can do wonderful things. But that is so important to making sure that relationship progresses in the way you want it to. Engagement, again, it's another important thing. It's not just what they are turning out and turning in, but what they look like, how they act, who do they talk to. All of that information is going to help you when you speak to your kids at home. Because it's usually not as simple as I'm not turning in my work. There's usually something else that they're getting hung up on, like, for example, not being able to participate in discussions that only the teacher is going to be able to, to tell you. Teachers will provide suggestions and advice. We like to see students succeed. If you ask, you will receive. And again, nearly always, you will get suggestions for what you can do at home. There are times when all of these things have been done and it's still not working. And that's okay. There are still options even when we get to this point and it's not working. All that means is that it's time to go back and reassess and figure out we have, what we have to do. That is one of the toughest places for our students to be in because usually when they get there, they feel like they're failing and they feel overwhelmed. And some of the emotional factors start to come into play too. So this spot, when they're struggling and we've given them support and it still doesn't feel like it's working, I think it's really important to note that this is when it's time for us to intervene. It's time to try something else so that the emotional load doesn't get to be too much. Another, another place to go for help is a department chair. If you have specific questions about a given content, they are in-house experts of each of the core departments. We can give you more information about how a student is performing in terms of test scores. At times, people will consult with outside resources, get independent evaluations. We can also help provide that information that we have here, should you need it. There is always the option to ask for even more support, um, if needed, through a 504 plan or an IEP, if it gets to that level. But one of the things that I always recommend, we try first, is enrollment in one of our supportive classes. These are regular education classes that are intended to teach our students both academic skills and soft skills to be better students. They're elective courses, so they do take a place of one of the elective choices on your student's schedule. But for a student who really is starting to struggle, it's a great way to feel like they're, they're coming out of that. Strategies for academic success focuses both on reading strategies, reading for information, reading for understanding, knowing how to approach a, a textbook, knowing how to approach something that is fiction. 
and then also the organizational pieces that they need to need to know in order to be students that find success. It is available not only at the freshman level, but also um, we offer strategies two and three. So if you didn't enroll for it, didn't enroll in it this year, but feel like that's something that you would want to do, it's still an option. And then we also offer freshman and sophomore seminar. These are usually students that the teachers will identify as really starting to need some extra support, mostly because they're either struggling with organization or they're not connected to school. Um, I would say that seminar, the best way to explain it is that it's soft skill building. It's teaching our students how to learn, how to think about their planning, how to do all of the other dispositional pieces that they need in order to find success here. The full course descriptions of these courses, they're on our website in the Academic Planning Guide. So I didn't link it here, but you can find all of that information um, on our website if it's something that you'd like to think about as we head into registration season. And again, if you feel like your child is getting to the point where they are emotionally overwhelmed, I really encourage you to reach out to their counselor because counselors do a variety of things here. They can help facilitate communication, get us information about academic, um, academic performance, but then also put you in uh, contact with some of our outside resources and community supports that we've had success with and we know other families have um, appreciated. We always recommend, and you've, I'm sure, heard this before, that our students are connected to something else outside of their regular day. And that's often kind of framed and because it's really important and they need to know other people and get involved and learn new things. I also think it's really important because they need some place to feel good, especially if they're academically struggling. They need a place to feel like they're meeting their passion and they're really good at something. And they need a place to be connected because when students start to struggle, the most natural reaction that we all have is to back away from it and to kind of insulate ourselves from that and not necessarily face those struggles. And the best way to make sure that you're still connected to school is if you have a, a teacher or a classmate or some sort of teammate somebody who's going to be there to say, hey, I care about you and you're going to get through this. These are my, my final thoughts. And as I was putting together this, um, this slide, I thought, what is it that I feel like at this point as a parent and as somebody who works in a school, what would I say are the most important things I've learned on my own journey? And the first is to steer your child away from blaming others. I know this happens. I can think of um, just this morning, so I'm trying to think of the things I worked with this morning. Um, is your Chromebook charged? And then, like, I think I say that, I don't know, three times, three times a day, and we're at about a 50% success rate of the Chromebook actually being charged. Um, and it's usually because, you know, mom didn't remind me, or it's, you, you guys, we've all been there. Um, so we work on, you have to accept this, you have to understand that you need to fix this. And again, that's simply because we want to start building those independent skills. We want to find ways to help our students feel successful. Find the thing that makes them feel like they're really good at something and that they can continue on and find, find success find happiness, find comfort here in their experience at North. Again, the teachers are here to help. I couldn't be prouder of this faculty. I've worked other places. North is special. We know that. We've all heard how many faculty members have moved their own students here to be in the North High attendance area. Please, please reach out to those teachers because I guarantee they will be a good resource for you. And again, it's about the learning. It's about where did we start and where did we go. Feel free at this point to throw out anyone else's perceptions of what success is for your kid. It's not AP classes. It's not grade point average. It's not where they even end up going to college. It's about what they are learning, what they're doing, how hard they're working, and where they, where they end up from where they started. 
And of course, in those moments where you see something that is wonderful and positive, there is nothing like seeing your kids smile when you say, that was awesome, that was great, you did a great job. And for many of our students, I think it's those little things, especially coming from family and coming from teachers that they remember that makes the difference. And now I'm going to bring up Lisa, who's going to offer us a little bit of a different perspective. I gave you sort of the, the, the school insight. And now you have some of the more professional insight, I guess, outside of the world of education. Sarah? OK, so I um, always like to blame the fact that I talk fast and move when I'm starting my timer. Because otherwise, I'll have you here for like the entire evening. It's exciting. Um, I used to blame it on being Italian, and I get all excited and I move a lot. I think it's just because I'm excited about everything that I talk about. Um, so I am an executive function skills specialist. Uh, does anyone know what that means? Okay. I'm finding that more and more. Um, the funny part is it's becoming a big buzzword. Uh, so executive functioning really refers to. Um, Organization, planning, time management, these are all the skills we need to be successful. But more than that, it's how do I analyze and break down a task? How do I know what I'm going to do? How do I know how I'm going to do it? How do I get started? How do I get it done? I could go on. Uh, we also have to talk about self-regulation, so behavior, social, emotional regulation. That is a big component of executive functioning. And then the piece that a lot of people don't realize falls under executive functioning is processing of information and synthesis and application. So how are you going to learn it? Your metacognition, how are you going to know how it is that you learn? What is your self-awareness around that? What are you going to do with the information? So I love co-presenting here, and the slides really are rocking, so thank you, ladies, because it's going to save me a lot of uh, talking points, and so I'll blast through some of those bullet points. Uh, I have been doing this probably for 18 years or so. Um, I did, I know that, uh, which Schwarz mentioned, I do have a sophomore here at North. We also have an eighth grader and a sixth Greater, and we do live in Dunwich Grove as well. Um, my office is over in Westmont. So I, I do have a unique perspective. I don't only work with students, I work with adults, individuals, districts, organizations, corporations. So it's an interesting how these skills that I just listed, and I'm guessing maybe some of you, most of you in the back of your mind, were like, oh yeah, I've got a couple of those I'm really great at, and a couple of those I'm not so great at. So we all have struggles with executive functioning. It's not technically a diagnosis, right? This is just a set of skills that you need to become successful. So a lot of that has to do with how differently we all think and learn and becoming aware of that and learning how to work with it and developing those skills. So that's kind of my, probably the most concise way I can explain executive functioning. It's a challenge for me always. Um, I'm going to go through a few things. I know we've been talking a lot about struggle, and this is the challenge with what I do, because no one comes to me saying, like, hey, everything's perfect. Let's chat. It's not like they're coming into my office. There is something sense of something going on that we need to address across one or more than one of those areas that I mentioned. So I'm going to run through my list of top reasons why I see students struggling, struggling and it could be in any one of those or more than one of those realms. Um, Really, a lot of it just comes down to not having the right processes, routines, planning systems in place, right? That's kind of basic. Again, a lot of this is pretty typical. It's age appropriate to have not developed these skills yet. Um, females, prefrontal cortex, the part of the front part of the brain that kind of controls this operation and, and type of thinking, fully developed in the early 20s for the males. Sorry, boys, it's a little bit later, maybe average age 27. Um, if you throw in any type of learning, cognitive concern, ADHD, autism, so. I work with those kids. I also work with a lot of kids who are very high IQ, intelligence, gifted, AP students, honor students. So this, these challenges show up in all types of individuals. This isn't just you know the kid over here who's got ADHD. Um, I eat, sleep, and breathe this stuff. So I, we have children with challenges at home. I've been in the trenches with it for a very long time, and I've seen a lot just across the different schools and families and, and groups that I've worked with. So uh, I, I say all of this just because I think sometimes we really feel like on the surface, it looks like something's going on. Usually what they come to us with is like, oh, well, they're just being lazy and they don't care. And that's generally almost never, ever, ever the case. Uh, and the kids will say that to themselves, too. They'll use that language. I'm like, oh, no, I really don't see laziness here. There's always a reason for that. There's always some kind of reason we can find. Um, so not having those right systems in place. Coexisting factors, I just mentioned some of those. That's a big one. A lot of increase in anxiety that we're seeing, depression, social emotional issues. Very, very challenging to focus in class when you're experiencing some outside stressors or there's some underlying, um, I would say, deficit, right? Um, so what I was mentioning before is I do talk a lot about the struggles 
But that's because people come to you with their struggles. And then the great news is, I've got a whole bunch of answers and ideas for what we can do about that. So needing to make sure that we're addressing concurrently those coexisting factors is critical. Um, trouble getting motivated, I did see that kind of in the survey results from everyone who signed up online and kind of put in what you'd like to hear about. That is definitely a challenge. We can't force them to be excited about school. However, if we do give them some of the appropriate tools and structures and we have those conversations, we can develop these skills and a sense of confidence to where they're actually realizing that they're more likely to be able to be successful and that helps with their motivation. When they see what needs to be done, it's easier to get motivated. It doesn't mean that if they hate math, they're going to go math. But they might be like, oh, well, now I can see how I can go about doing it, and it's not as miserable as it used to be. Um, procrastination, obviously, is a big one. Overwhelmed, huge. And this is that whole idea of they need to learn how to struggle. I could not agree more with everything that's already been said tonight. Um, they need to learn how to fail and what to do about that when those cases arise. Lack of awareness is a big one. So I have juniors sitting in my office on a regular basis who will come in and we're kind of doing a little grade discovery and analysis, figuring out what's going on. And they'll get six months into the year and not realize that the physics teacher actually has like an online portal with all of these quizzes and things they were supposed to be doing the entire year because they didn't have the awareness that was there. It was probably announced on the first day of class and it was written on the assignment sheet and they just didn't notice it. So it's that lack of awareness of all of those executive functioning, you know, those functions are required to figure out What's the assignment? Where do I find it? How do I do it? Do, where do I turn it in? Is it online? Is it on paper? I mean, in this day and age, technology is a wonderful thing, right? But it makes it a little bit more complicated from a management perspective. Um, a lot of them are just confused sometimes or embarrassed to ask about those things. You can't get one month, two months into the year and, and feel comfortable saying to your teacher, where do I find the homework again? Because that's probably not going to be received very well. Um, of course, the teachers here will most likely be great and respond wonderfully like, oh, I guess I was kid too, hey. Uh, so, being unsure how to do it, we talked about this, it's a lot about how to. How do I study? How do I take notes? Sarah touched on this, it's so important. How do I ask for help? The most important thing that you can be doing as parents to support your students are helping them to develop the skills across these areas. And I'm going to roll through a bunch of ideas for how to do that. So lack of study skills, not doing well on quizzes and tests, um, that really just kind of can be cyclical. Distractions, obviously, I'm assuming that most of our children here in the room have some kind of a smartphone, um, any kind of social issues, outside stresses. And then, this is a big one too, it's kind of one of those that we uncover as we move along. I, will, I, I watched actually one of my children, I'm not throwing them under the bus this year, <laughs> one of them sit and study for hours the other day, knowing full well that their version of studying was kind of just like looking over, you're reading over the material. And I knew, I knew it wasn't going to go well. And I also know exactly how to help, but I'm just mom, so I didn't want my help. Uh, and I, and sure enough, it didn't go very well. And I could see the frustration because they were like, I don't know, I studied for two hours for this, I don't understand. I'm like, but what, did you pay attention to detail, or did you just kind of gloss over? So that's a big one when it comes to all of these areas. So what we're going to talk about here, because you're sitting here as a parent, thankfully no longer a high school student, right? Um, how do I help and how much should I help? So I'm a really big proponent of fostering independence and ownership in your children. I'm not a big fan of parents being over-involved. However, there are ways as they're learning to develop these skills that we can support and help them along the way and to kind of accelerate things. So, things that we can do. Um, choosing what we're going to develop, I know that this was already mentioned. What do you want to prioritize? Is it the grades? Is it the effort? Is it the follow-through? Is it their executive functioning, right? For me, that's the most important. But that's going to be kind of that, let's emphasize the process and the behaviors that we need shape, not necessarily the grades. The grades are a really nice indicator of whether or not what we're doing is working, but that should not be our outcome. It should be really focused on the process and the learning and the doing. Um, the get it, I say parent-child, get on the same page meeting or a goal-setting meeting. Get out a blank sheet of paper, sit down with your child, and have a powwow. Okay, what do you want? What do you want? I do this in all of our initial appointments. We bring parent and student in together. That's always a fun one. Uh, I didn't used to do it that way, and I moved back to it because it's so critical that everyone gets to hear what the other person thinks, and then we kind of put it in a language. I've yet to have a situation where we can't agree on some common goals, but your child's perception right now of what you are wanting from them and what you really want from them are oftentimes two very different things. Well, they only ask about my grades, and that's all they care about, and they just want me to get straight A's, and all they care about is college, and ah! And the parents walk in and sit down and say, I really don't care about the grades, to be honest with you. Do I think he can get an A in that class? Sure. I don't care. I don't see him studying. I don't see him doing the work. Like, I really just care about the effort and the process. So make sure that that's very clear. Because even though you've said that to your kids, it's kind of like the positive things you say. You can say it 100 times. They think you said it once. And then if there's one little negative 
thing that you suggest, or you'll say it once, and they think you said it a hundred times. You're always telling me that. Or I just said it once. Maybe if you tried this, you know, and, oh, you're always on me about my grades. Never I know about your grades. So make sure that you get those explanations clear and talk about what does it look like. I don't know if you can really read some of this. It's a little far, but what does that actually look like to meet those expectations? What does good, good hard work look like? and talk about it in terms that they'll be able to actually go and follow through on or to understand. Um, recognize and observe what is happening. So I, I mentioned this one a lot. One of my favorite things about being in this role, I mean, obviously now as a parent, I'm guilty of some of this stuff myself, a lot of it. Um, but take a moment and just realize, you know, address the blame piece. Are we blaming the other people? Oftentimes our kids are blaming teachers, parents, everybody but themselves. That's just developmental, the stage, developmental the stage they're at. But who is this about or what's it about is a great question to ask of ourselves as well. Because oftentimes, and as the years move on and the stakes get higher and college approaches, it is really challenging as a parent to not get caught up in all the talk. And many of you have freshmen, and so if any of them were looking at kind of maybe thinking about the honors, essay that they had to write, you, everyone starts talking and talking and talking, and that will heighten our anxiety, and then we sometimes project that and take that on in our kids. So just take a moment and pause, look inside, talk with them, kind of get all the cards on the table. Um, other things we can do, research and question and try to figure out why, like I said. Laziness, not generally the reason. Why are you being lazy? Oh, you're procrastinating. Sure, why am I procrastinating? Why, though? Why? What's the reason? Because what we have to do is address that underlying reason. Um, identify and ruling out all those coexisting conditions that I mentioned, and I left a whole bunch of them out, but if there's something else going on, we can do all of the teaching and skills development work in the world, and it isn't going to do any good because they are not going to be able to call on and access and use it unless we address concurrently what other things might be occurring for that individual. Focusing on the process I've mentioned, so critical for me, helping them to develop, to know how to do it, to know what to do. Giving them the tools or helping them to learn to use tools or create their own tools and structures or find someone who can. Oftentimes, as I mentioned earlier, your kids don't want to hear it from you, but there are plenty of people around. I know Sarah's went through a whole bunch of resources. We've got fabulous resources here at North. Find someone who can help you. And then providing those structures, the visuals, the foundations, if they're willing to have your help. If not, I'll leave it on the counter and hopefully kind of tuck it in their spiral. Maybe they'll see it. Give them some guidance. They don't have these skills fully developed at their ages. So we do have to remember that, but also it's going to be important that we do what we can to help them. Um, talk about, is this a can't or a won't? So that's an important thing for parents to kind of discuss. Is this a, I'm refusing to do it, or is it a said, I can't do it? And a lot of times they'll present it as though, they can't, but they really just aren't. Because it's too hard, they're shutting down, they haven't learned how to struggle, how to get through hard things. It's more of a grit and perseverance issue. Um, implement accountability measures. Kids like deadlines, kids like and respond to structure and accountability. Um, this is often sometimes something that we work in in our private work. We'll have parents come to us and, and say, well, I've tried everything. I don't know, she's just always on the phone. So naturally we say, well, maybe they're always on it, maybe they're kind of on it, we'll see. And then as we're working with the student, they're starting to admit over time, yeah, you know, I'm really having trouble putting that phone down, self-regulating, whatever it might be. I've had student after student say to me, I think I need my parents' help. They just need to ground me so that I can't go out on school nights and hang out with my friends after school, so I have to do my homework. I need them to take the phone. They just need to take the phone. I'm like, great. But we're calling them in here, and then you're going to tell them that because this is what it's about. If you need the accountability, there's nothing wrong with that. I can tell you a number of adults, myself included, I like deadlines, and I need accountability. It works really well for me, but I'm asking for it, right? They don't always realize that they need it, but it is helpful. So make sure that if you are, are feeling that would be helpful to your child or asking them if that would be helpful, talk about what that might look like, and then follow through is going to be the most important thing. I have that in caps. Okay, perfect. That's the trickiest part as a parent. I am so guilty of it myself. I have this big plan that every day I was going to turn in those phones, and until your chores are done and your homework is done, nobody's getting their phone back. Do I really do that? Ever? No. It's a great idea. I've yet to do it more than like once. And it worked really beautifully. It was a wonderful afternoon. and Everything got done quickly. Um, but it's very difficult. As parents, we're busy. A lot of us are working. We have sometimes multiple children. A whole lot of things going on. Um, I do want to make a quick note about the school resources. We have a ton here, they're amazing. And as Sarah mentioned, lots of times we really do need to help them figure out how to use them. The lack of awareness, they aren't even aware that they're here, no matter how many teachers told them, they were thinking about 15,000 other things on the first couple of days and weeks of school. Not necessarily the one you know time that the teacher mentioned that this was a great resource. So help them figure out how to use them, when to use them, problem solve around it. I know a lot of students come to us and just say, 
I don't want to ask for help, or I don't want to go to resource because I'm going to look stupid. Help them figure out how to work through that. Play out the possible scenarios. What could end up happening if they don't get in? What do we need to work through and what do you need to tell yourself? How is this going to look for you? So that I would encourage you strongly to help them get through that because it's going to apply on and on throughout school and into their future lives. Um, so I kind of try to break this into a few key areas because like I said, I have a, I didn't bring it up here with me, a giant book full of all kinds of charts and tools. Um, if you do see anything in here that you like, I think that they are, Sarah is going to be emailing out a copy of the presentation. So I know you won't be able to see a lot of what's up here from especially way back at the back of the room, but I wanted to just put it up here kind of as a, to give you some direction. So a couple key things you can do as parents is help them learn how to plan. There's about a thousand ideas for this. Um, how do they meet expectations, manage outcomes, achieve their goals? Couple things. Number one, this is one of my favorite tools for freshmen. Usually we're starting to kind of really dig into this after the first few weeks of school. I have this giant crazy chart that's cut off. It kind of goes on and on, and down and down. Um, there is a link in the presentation to an example of that so you can see all the prompts. But this is that idea of some students really aren't aware that they can do a retake or a redo in a certain class or where to find the information and resources. So I call this the master organization chart. It takes work to complete this, but this is such a valuable tool if you can take the time with your student to teach them how to get all the information in one place. And in doing so, it's going to possibly uncover a lot as they're digging through that syllabus. Like I said, I'll have kids get through, college students even, that I work with will get through three months of the semester and not realize that the syllabus actually listed these two new projects that are becoming up, kind of coming up in their doing a week. Or, oh, there's an extra online portal where they need to be doing assignments. So that will be kind of like a search and discover mission through the syllabus. And or, if there are blank boxes, where are we going to get the answer? It's not in the syllabus. Going to have to ask the teacher. Well, I don't want to ask my teacher. Okay, now we got to we get a chance and opportunity to practice developing that skill. So, super powerful, super simple. Um, it looks kind of crazy by the end, but it's covering all of these key areas. What's a late policy? What do I do if I'm absent? Where does my grade come from? What percentage breakdown is it? Um, where do I go for help? Who are some kids in the class I can grab their name and I would say cell phone number, but I feel like that's even outdated. Their snap code or whatever it is that they're going to communicate. I can't keep on top of it. But get their information somehow. How am I going to find you so that I can say, hey, bud, what was the homework tonight? Oh, I wasn't there. Is there something she said about that paper that's due? Um, accommodations if they have them. How am I going to use them? That's a whole other ball game. So have those conversations. That's just a nice visual structure to kind of get answers to a lot of those questions. Um, helping them learn to manage it all, this is so critical. Overwhelm, anxiety, stress, perceived overwhelm can be very challenging for students who don't yet have the ability to manage that for themselves. So this is a piece I could talk about for an hour, I won't. Find them either an effective planner, or if we have the school one, help them to learn how to effectively use the planner. Okay, so the planner that I use is a kind of a Monday through Friday, left to right, morning till night, top down, they put their classes in order, Makes more logical sense. There is a three o'clock till 10 o'clock window at the bottom of the planner for them to actually start to see what does their week look like, okay? So learning how to plan is not something they naturally do for the most part. And the planner, if you look at your student's assignment notebook, if they're even using an assignment notebook, and there's a hundred ways this could look, but you might just see like HW. Cool, great, glad they wrote homework. You've got homework, awesome. What's the homework? Oh, it's on Google Classroom. Okay, if you actually know it's on Google Classroom, fine. You know, I'm okay with you putting homework if you know where to find it. Um, but what we're not seeing is, are we using this as an actual task management tool and a tool to actually like, figure out when things are going to happen, how to break it down, how to think forward as to what's coming, how to look and say, okay, if I've got two tests and a quiz on Friday, and then, oh, we're going out for Grandma's birthday, and then I've got Spanish tutoring and an orthodontist appointment on Thursday, plus other homework, uh-oh, wait, when is that homework? going to actually get done and when is the studying going to get done. Studying is not something kids often view as homework so what we try to teach them to do is then say all right if you've got that test let's back it up. Notice you do not just see the word study written in the days leading up to that test. We want them to be really really specific and I have another tool that I'll show you in a minute to teach them how to actually plan for how to study. There are a lot of steps involved in studying and the more concrete and specific we can be the better. So instead of study 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 it should be do practice problems create a study guide of my own, do a quiz that make note cards, go see teacher. We want to really break down all those pieces that might be helpful for that individual class. So I have something that we call um, a class and study plan. And so these, and so these are all just examples. Most of the time I end up just doing the 
these on random sheets of paper with students or we type them into like a Google Doc. It doesn't have to be formal and fancy, but the idea behind this is sometimes these students in every aspect of everything we're talking about need prompts and cues. They can't self-generate. They're either overwhelmed or they just haven't developed the skill yet to be able to come up with the ideas on their own, so they need some options and they need some prompting. So this is um, a tool that we use in the top half here to talk about how to be successful in the class. What do I need to focus on? Is it a participation-based class? Uh, are there papers only and no tests and quizzes? Are there only tests and quizzes and no participation or homework points? What does this teacher really focus on? And then what do I personally need to do to do well? So these take time to develop, but we want to, again, be very, very specific. The bottom section is more of that how do I actually study piece. So we want students really, at the end of the day, to develop some kind of a process, get it to be super specific, and then to to learn to do something with the information. I gave that example earlier about one of my own children studying very hard, um, and I know that sometimes what studying looks like actually for the majority of students is just looking over, and I do this, not to be dismissive, but because it, they call it studying, but like, eh, I don't know, is letting your eyes pass over the words really kind of studying? Generally speaking, probably it's not gonna get you the results that you want. Have them work with it, write it, see it, do it, create a chart. Uh, like all kinds of good ideas for that, but let's talk about what are those options and then let's kind of put them into a sequence and then these are the pieces that they're going to want to be doing leading up to the test that they can write into their planner. So if they know it's always helpful to make a formula sheet or to condense all their notes onto a study guide or to color code the vocab terms, whatever they have decided in that class with that teacher that year is going to work, let's make it a specific plan and then these are the pieces that we get plugging in, that we plug into the planner. So I've got a couple different versions, like I said, of this. I threw them in here, I'm not gonna read every little piece, but just so that you can see them if you do follow up and pull the presentation up later, um, you'll get some really I, great ideas about how specific we actually have to be or to teach them to be if we want them to be successful in managing their classes. So this one was the specific how to actually do well in math class. We customize these every year for the teacher given the scenario, knowing what they're dealing with. And it's very, very specific stuff. Like, oh, you've got to preview the material because I know I never really get it the first time around. Awesome, let's put that in there. Um, making sure that I'm checking the answers, that I'm, if they're not correct, I'm making a note to myself and I'm asking for help. And all of that in being successful in the class needs to be something that we kind of can break down and make a plan for. And then I put a couple of study plans in here. Um, I pulled several of these examples from actual North students. So, <laughs> so it's kind of nice. Some of them are very relevant. Um, how to do it. Let's talk about it. Okay, first take out the Chromebook and open the answer keys. I don't want you studying for math if, I think pretty much all the teachers here do provide the answer keys. They do a really fabulous job of letting the kids kind of have access to those so they can figure out what they did wrong and learn to make corrections or learn what they need to do for the future. So let's get those up and moving. And then really, really detail-oriented, focusing on all the pieces. Do they know what to even do in the problem? If it's a variation of the problem, do they know which steps to call on? So they, we want to make sure that they have this specific plan for how to actually study. Um, I put one in here for biology. There's another example. But there's a, as you know, there's a, there's a lot of details here. This is not just look over or study that we're talking about. We have so many ways that students can actually work with the information to be able to learn it, but not only learn it, so that they can then apply it when it comes to the test. And usually what we find is that kids are doing one or two of these things, sometimes none, um, but generally not all. And then it could be just two of these little pieces that that's the reason why they're not getting the success that they want on their assessments. Um, so here, I threw in an example here. When we talk about working with the information, um, we could do a whole separate workshop, obviously, on study skills. <laughs> so I'm giving you kind of like our best of the best. So really, at the end of the day, learning to kind of make it visual and make some kind of a study guide. So they're flipping through the notes. They're pulling out the key information. Sometimes I'll have them go up and um, go on to Google pull up Google Images on the topic and find a really good, great summary of what that concept is. Print it out, write all over it. But I want them to be knowing, okay, what is the situation? And then what, that's not my I'm done timer, just so we know that's my I have like five minutes timer, so thankfully. <laughs> Had to do that, otherwise I just roll right through. So, um, but the idea here is we really want to retrain how they're actually processing the information and then how they're using it or accessing it during the test. So if it's a graph, I have to use these steps. But if I'm presented with a table instead of a graph, oh, I have to use this entirely different set of steps. Hmm, didn't know that before. That's what we want them studying are the steps, the processes, writing notes to themselves. So this would be an example 
um, of an algebra review. And so we are having notes right next to it as to translating what needs to happen. They're studying what is the question asking, then what do I do in that case? And they're writing out like a step-by-step -step plan for it. And so I actually a lot because I've worked within um, like advanced math classes. So I don't know, calculus or stats where they're really starting to struggle. And we're talking about kids who you know, generally enjoy math, do pretty well, but they're starting to fall apart because they had never had to learn how to actually do this and learn how to work with the information and study. So making your own study guide is what I would call this type of thing. Um, so giving them ways to work with the information, excellent thing to do. Routines is going to be a big one. I did see a couple of notes on, you know, how do I get my kid to actually do all of these things? Or, and that's, well, two different, two different pieces. But one of them is, okay, are they even aware of everything that's expected of them? And then all the things they need to be doing based on kind of a few of the things that we talked about tonight. We can talk about all those things that need to be done. Well, how are we going to remember them? And then how are we going to actually do them? So starting to establish routines. I always start with a really, really detailed version that is crafted over time. I think every student needs to have an after-school kind of routine that they go through, and then also kind of a weekend, I call it a regroup. So over the weekend, are we looking at the grades, kind of reflecting on where we wanted to be? Are we getting reorganized and kind of filing all the papers away? Are we making a list of things we need to ask questions about? Are we looking ahead of the week and updating the planner to see if there's a project or a test or a quiz? That is stuff that's difficult to keep up on sometimes during the week. Most of the teachers do provide some advance notice on either regular assignments and or tests, quizzes, papers. Those deadlines or due dates are given in advance. So those are things that can be filled in the planner and broken down on the weekend when sometimes they have a little bit more time. Um, I think this is my last section here is on helping them to learn how to analyze and adjust. We talk about grades. Yes, they're important because they're an indicator. Is that what we want to obsess on? Probably not. However, we can use them and most students actually when asked want to use them to let them know, um, am I doing what it takes or is there some problem that needs to be solved here? So I have a tool called the grade analysis. Um, I like the kids to be really specific in saying, given this teacher and your level, where you're at, how you're feeling about the coursework and the content, what do you feel you're capable of getting in this class? And I, I don't want them to put like, oh yeah, I just want like a B. What kind of B? Do you want an 81? Do you want an 87? Do you want an 89? Do you want a 94? Is it A? I don't know. Put that down. Uh, there's three sections to the grade analysis. At a home access center, I'm going to mention too that uh, where you can check grades. I'm not a really big fan of parents checking the kids' grades at all, really. Um, what I prefer is that you ask your child to check your grades, bring the computer over and have a chat with you, and fill you in on it. They know you can check them, but it generally doesn't do anybody any good for you guys to be at work. Not that any of you do this, but it happens a lot. Um, checking and checking and obsessing and then texting and like, why you had enough on this? Did you go through the teacher? It's very difficult. I'm a parent. It's go up on my computer, but I really, really, really try not to look at it. Um, except that one time, I was kind of curious about that test grade. So the idea is we want them checking it, and then we want to teach them how to analyze it. Even the kids who are checking their grades oftentimes will look at it and be like, dang, I got to see. Okay, what's for dinner? They're not really thinking about what they could do differently next time and what could be learned. So I want them to kind of make a list of all those little details. The middle section is I want to look at the category averages, looking for those patterns that, that I think Sarah mentioned this. We want to see um, in the Home Access Center, so if you do log in or if you have your children to log in and then pull it up for you, in the upper right-hand corner all the way at the top, there's a button that says Full View. So if you click Full View, what that does is it kind of um, shows you at the bottom of each class the averages for each broken down by category. So it'll say, oh, well, their participation average is a 92 and their test average is a 72. That'll give you a lot and your child a lot of information. Most kids don't realize that that's an option. So teach them how to do that and then look at the patterns and then at the bottom start talking about the plans. This is the part where we get to brainstorm and say, okay, what's where we, what's not where we want and what are we going to do about that? So I cut and pasted some little examples here that are in the presentation so just so you can kind of get a feel for what the students are doing. It's really impressive what they can self-generate when given the right prompts and cues and help, when we help them to learn how to analyze and reflect on it. And how to really look at it. They can say like, oh yeah, well I should study more. I'm like, oh, what does that look like? Oh, I should probably do the review packet. Great, do the review packet. And now they know what action steps to take instead of saying study more. Um, the self-regulation piece, I have a tool called Call Yourself Out. So critical, a lot of this, some of it they know they're just not doing it, always a reason. Let's talk about what are those reasons for that for the individual student. You know, is it that they're afraid to try because they don't want to fail? Is it that they're stressed and anxious or there's a social issue going on? Is it that they don't know how to study? Is it that they're avoiding and procrastinating? And if so, what are we going to do about it? So I like to talk about creating if-thens with them. This works. I love adults who then take this away and do it. And my if-thens, I really want 
to look at what those categories are that are showing up, and then action steps. So this is the do section. What can I actually do in that case? So if I can't focus, what can I do? Oh, well, let's try to change your environment. Change your seat at the table. Change the room in your house. Go to the library. That might work. Let's make a list, like a menu of options, of actionable steps they can take to remediate or address that situation. And then reminders, a lot of kids are like, well, I just need to remember. My parents are going to scream at me, and then I'm going to probably just study more. Great. I'm going to Parents will scream at me. I don't care. What's meaningful to you? What do you need to tell yourself in that moment when it's occurring? So I, I just put a couple of extra examples of that in there. This is one of my students who actually, I think, took this away to college with her. And she had this, like, targeted list of things that were consistently getting in her way and her menu of choices. It doesn't mean that she has to do those every time, but she can look at that and be like, ah, which one's going to work today? So helping them to see it, the more visual and specific we can make these things, the better off we're going to be. So um, that's pretty much all I got for you. I do have a little like what to do and not do. I know parent teacher conferences are around the corner here. So if you're attending conferences, I'll try and see if I can pop the link into this, but it's just an infographic on like real common teacher feedback, some things maybe that I would not recommend um, in our experience, and then things that would be helpful, which summarizes a lot of what we talked about tonight. And then I know we're going to talk in the November meeting about um, semester exam and final exam prep. So we, I'll be back and then we'll all be speaking about supports at the school and some additional tools that can be used for that. Um, my contact info is all on here. I have a lot of like video tutorials related to this stuff, so if anybody wants to, they're in like the blogs or the tutorials, you can check out the links there. Um, that's all I got. That's really close to 30 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. All right, we're going to get set up now. We're going to bring our resident expert up, our senior, um, to talk a little bit about her experience here at North. But before we did that, I just wanted to give you all a moment to just think through the questions you might have. Because we want to be sure that when you leave here, we provide as many answers to you um, as we can uh, in this setting. So we'll give you a moment while we get set up to go ahead and please talk amongst yourselves or just self-reflect and, and think about what you would like to know before you leave. All right, well, our other student panelist, unfortunately, uh, sent me a message that she is stuck at work which happens sometimes in our students' lives. It actually is a really good reminder of just how busy they really are. You know, um, to think that they were here all day and many often then go to practice and then have a job and then have homework, it um, makes it easy to see how some of those struggles with organization can creep up. But why don't we go ahead and get started. I'm gonna have you introduce yourself and your year in school. My name is Nicola and I'm a senior. All right, so as a freshman, I had sport and clubs and homework to maintain, just like a lot of the other freshmen. For something that was easy for me was finding a place that I fit in. DGN does a really great job of having a club for everybody, every club you can think of we have. But what was challenging for me was definitely time management. I would come home from my sport, eat dinner, and then get to homework around 8 o'clock assuming that I didn't go on my phone or want to relax because it is a full school day and then a sport, you just want to sit down and relax. So time management was definitely a problem for me. So. Um, Strategies for Academic Success is a class that I took as a freshman and I found it extremely helpful. I was hesitant to take it at first because I didn't feel like I needed it, but I definitely did. Um, I think the most important thing I learned from that class was note-taking strategies. They taught me the types of strategies and when to use them, and I still use them today. So. Did you find beyond strategies that there were other things? You said the resources. What about um, teachers that might have been helpful along the way or their suggestions? Anything in particular that, that kind of stood out to you in your time here? I think specifically math resource is a place that I spent a lot of my time freshman year. I was in math 1S, which is a period and a half, so you get a little extra time to work. And then I would go on to math resource to get even more help, but definitely very, very helpful. There's always a teacher in there that knows the subject that you're in, the class that you're in. So I think the resources were definitely resource centers. 
I definitely wish I knew that sports coaches understand that you are a student and you have homework and academic expectations and if you need to meet a teacher after school and you're going to be late to practice that's okay and they understand that. And I also wish I knew that my counselor is not just there to help me with my schedule or to switch a class. They're there for any academic needs you have or anything you need to talk about. My counselor actually helped me come up with a schedule so I knew what times I should be getting things done, which was really helpful with time management. What advice would you give somebody new to DGSU who is either a freshman or a transfer student? I would definitely say find something in a, your day that is just for you and something that you're going to enjoy, even if that's a study hall. I think it's really important to have a thing in your day that you look forward to. I personally am passionate about working with people that have special needs. So I join the Circle of Friends Club so I get a chance to build bonds with people that have special needs. and. My junior and senior year, I was a PE leader for the special ed class. So I always had something to look forward to throughout the day. I would say um, if your student is struggling in the beginning, you do have to understand that it is a big transition to become a high school student and while there are students that get the hang of it really quickly, there are students that don't and that's completely fine. When I was a freshman, I was getting mostly C's and D's and then about halfway through the school year I got tested for ADHD and then was properly, properly medicated and now I get straight A's with a couple of B's. So there's always a way to help your student and obviously take advantage of all the resources we have at DGN first. but there is always a way to help them and just be understanding. Thank you so much. You know, I think we can um, stand up here as the adults, but we just have a different perspective. So I always appreciate when we have students that come in and speak because they really are closest to probably what your um, son or daughter is thinking and feeling. So thank you so much for being here. So at this point, I wanted to give you a chance to ask any questions. We will open up the uh, floor now and please feel free to ask anything because chances are, as we know, somebody else in the room probably has the same question. Okay, I just want to know how do we get to the math department website and the math resource? You know what, it will be linked in the presentation um, and you'll be able to just click that link and go directly there or um, if you leave me your email address, I can even send it to you directly tonight. I think I saw one more hand. Go ahead. So, sometimes kids have good like foundational study habits. Do you see them needing to change their course of action as they get ready for tests like an SAT or an AP test? Because if they're, those types of tests are sometimes structured differently. So, just wondering if you could. Um, provide some insight into that. Absolutely. They are very different. Um, when you think about something like an AP exam or especially like the SAT and ACT, it's of course a test of what students know and um, their knowledge base, but it's also when you're thinking about something like the um, SAT, it is a test of stamina. It's nearly five hours long. Math comes um, nearly at the end. It's followed up by writing, two of our students' favorite things when they're tired. And you do watch the students, when I'm up there, sort of start to wilt over time. So what I will always recommend first is that you use those resources that the College Board provides. It's actually really impressive. Now, once students have taken the PSAT 8-9, if you link the College Board account, which is where you can get all of the information and all of your, your students' scores, if you link that to Khan Academy, it will send your child into individualized practice that corrects to the levels that your student is at so it can build in at the standards and skills that they're currently demonstrating that they need. So that is something I absolutely always recommend. Um, I'll be sure that that is linked to the presentation as well. They even offer something as simple as it's the SAT question of the day. 
it sends students a test, uh, text message, they click on it, and they have one SAT type prep um, question for the day. So it's really those little things um, to get them to get them ready. Um, practice tests are always available online. I recommend those as well. The public library will do even free tests. One of the most um, I guess just moments of, of empathy that I have experienced in recent histories. I sat down and took an SAT um, myself this summer. Oh my goodness. I mean, <laughs> just the, the way um, those tests have changed over time, the level of questions, the amount of evidence they need to go back and look at and to do that quickly. That is a, a, a different sort of, of skill set. So I'm glad that you are thinking about it right now, but I also will say that the foundation of being ready for those tests is being in the classes that are right and, and provide the most rigor. Our students, even without the test prep, usually do pretty well on those standardized tests, but of course, if you do anything with practice and focus and attention, they will grow and they will see some, um, some increase in points from one test to the next. My freshman year, I took a lunch, and then my sophomore year, I did not. And that transition was a little difficult, so I do recommend taking a lunch, even if you want to cram, cram, cram into your schedule. Um, something that I took my freshman year, I'm trying to think. I mean, I was pretty happy with my schedule. Math 1S, I did like and I did think was very beneficial and I do think students don't want to be in that class because if you're in the class you need extra help and it's kind of hard to admit that sometimes. So I would recommend that you give that a chance if it is recommended to you. But besides that. Just one thought on the no lunch conversation because that is something that always comes up around registration time. We, generally speaking, say we believe our students need a break in their day for their well-being, for their sanity, to be able to get work done uh, during the school day. However, that's always an individual conversation and you know your student best because for many kids, it's just too much. For other kids, they handle it okay. There's the balance of what they're doing after school. There's the balance of how well they study, how efficiently. So um, just something to think about because um, while absolutely some students can do it, we do more often hear um, from students that say that was, that was tough, that was tough to do. Yes, absolutely. What I will say is that the teachers will change over the days of the week, but the subject areas do not. So actually, it's posted right out there. Uh, there's a, a poster as you walk out, you'll see the periods, and then the, the content areas that have teachers in, in each hour. Okay, that was my next question. Is, is there some, like my son has third period studying also, and if there's someone every period? There is at least um, two teachers every period. So we do our best and we're successful most periods at making sure there's a teacher from each content area. Math resource is simple, it's always math. But over here in the combined resource, it's science, English, and social studies, and nearly every period, we will have people from each of those contents. But we also try to do things like, for example, if I'm a bio teacher, that's a, a different skill set than if I teach physics. So we also try to make sure that we're providing um, just a, a wide range of support throughout the day. I'm sorry, you know what, yeah. let's go to you in the back. Yeah, um, I had a question. Uh, if I wanted to access the Google Classroom for my student, uh, is that, how would I do that? Is there a link out there that you could send us? Because I, it, it's, I, don't want the, I don't want my child to guide me. I want to have an idea of what they're looking at before they guide me so that I can have like a reference point. 
and without having that, you feel there's like this like this technology wall between between what they're doing and how you perceive where they should be going as well, which would help you help them. Um, what I can tell you is that um, in order to join a Google Classroom, there's a join code that the teacher would have to provide. Um, my recommendation is to reach out to that teacher specifically because not only would they be able to provide you the join code, but each teacher is going to have um, a different setup for their Google Classroom. So that would be the, the best place to start. Just email the teacher directly. One more over here. You just recently worked out how a child can get her grades online. I was wondering, is there a different way the parents get uh, the child's grades? Yes. So when you um, log into Home Access Center, it requires a different login for you as a parent. So if you go online to our website and click on the Parents tab, there is a set of step-by-step -step, step -step instructions to guide you through that. But if you find that that doesn't work, then um, our tech department, if you just call our tech department during the day, you will get a live person that will help you make sure your account is set up correctly. Anything else? All right, well, thank you so much for being here. And um, feel free at any point to reach out um, tonight if you have questions. If something comes up as you walk to the car and you wish you would have asked, uh, reach out to any of us. And I will also get that presentation out to you as soon as possible. If you did not pre-register, please be sure that I have your email address over on that yellow legal pad just to make sure that I send the presentation. Oh, okay, two more, two more things real quick. Sorry. Um, just two other save the dates or things to put on your radar. We also host a Keys for Academic Success workshop that is guided by our, um, our reading specialists that help teach parents specific strategies to use um, when studying with their child. And we will have another um, FYI meeting coming up in November where we'll think more about semester exams, course registration, and get ready for that point in the year. And that is November 20th. We weren't exactly sure of the date, <laughs> so I just checked it. It is November 20th. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you.